In this news roundup of the week for 29th of July 2022, a major climate change bill suddenly appears in the US when everyone was least expecting it. More signs of the health impact of lockdowns are emerging, but people are instead focusing on monkeypox. The UK NHS shuts down the Tavistock Gender Clinic, whose rush to prescribe puberty blockers was labelled as a danger to children. And in this week's short thought, is body positivity something to be embraced or roundly rejected? My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Just when it was the last thing you expected in US politics right now, it seems that a major climate spending bill has appeared as though from nowhere. Even though everybody had given up on such a possibility when centrist Democrat Senator Joe Manchin had torpedoed the prospects a few weeks back, it turned out that talks had continued quietly between Manchin and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. The result, an agreed bill, was announced this week that is aimed at cutting US carbon emissions from 2005 levels by an estimated 40% by 2030. It puts $370 billion into energy security and climate change measures, which includes tax credits for a range of technologies, including solar and wind power, energy storage, carbon capture, hydrogen and small-scale nuclear. According to the Politico website, the bill will also include a $7,500 credit for electric vehicles. The trade-off for Manchin, who represents an area with strongly traditional energy interests, is that it includes a plan to ease rules that constrict fossil fuel production and work against upgrades to the power grid. That compromise led some progressive environmental activists to label the bill as a sham and to accuse Biden of engaging in a bait-and-switch tactic on climate legislation, although other groups said that they could live with the trade-off. The bill, entitled the Inflation Reduction Act, represents a significantly bigger measure than Democrats had thought possible, while still being significantly shy of the original so-called Build Back Better bill. The money it spends will be raised by IRS tax enforcement, closing tax loopholes and establishing a corporate minimum tax for the largest corporations. However, most of the Democrats' wished for tax increases are not included, particularly the plans to tax the unrealised capital gains of the wealthy and the corporate tax increases in line with a global tax deal. Basically, the bill introduces those two tax measures out of an initial Democrat wish list of about 40. It will appear in the Senate next week. If it actually gets passed, it would be presented as a major win for the Biden administration on a key manifesto plank that had seen precious little success to date. President Joe Biden described it as the action the American people have been waiting for. He will have been particularly relieved to get the agreement finally in advance of the midterm elections, which are highly likely to see Democrats lose one or both of the House and the Senate, so would therefore be unable to get such a bill passed from that point onwards. Needless to say, such a prospect does not especially please the Republicans. Senators christened the measure as Build Back Broke and hammered the tax increases in the bill. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said Democrats have already crushed American families with historic inflation. Now they want to pile on giant tax hikes that will hammer workers and kill many thousands of American jobs. Ironically, Republicans had been cheering for Joe Manchin for his role in pushing back Democrat action on climate. Those cheers turned to jeers at a stroke. Politics can be such a fickle thing. Will this apparent success prove to be sufficient now to dissuade Biden from the action we discussed last week when he was considering, namely declaring a climate emergency? Given that the rationale for that move was that Congress was failing to legislate, you would presume that would be the end of such a question. In reality, the equation will likely come down to whether it will be seen helpful or harmful in terms of the coming election contest. While the sight of the administration actually getting something passed might be better optics than people are used to, you'd have to think that the state of the economy would be weighing more heavily, as this week it was reported that GDP had shrunk for the second consecutive quarter. 
You could tell in advance that this was about to happen by the fact that the administration immediately started trying to nitpick the term recession. Typically, it's been two consecutive quarters of falling GDP. Earlier this week, you got the White House Council of Economic Advisers saying, while some maintain that two consecutive quarters of falling GDP constitutes a recession, that is neither the official definition nor the way economists evaluate the state of the business cycle. Media on the right reported that the US was in recession. Media on the left reported that the latest figures raised fears of a recession. With the cost of living crisis, you can take it as read that most citizens will be less interested in that nuance than the fact they feel economically worse off than they did. I'm old enough to remember the election where it's the economy stupid was the internal campaign slogan. I don't imagine things going to be so different for the election to come. Speaking of which, one thing that some have been rather surprised at in the run-up to these midterm elections have been the actions of some Democrats to boost Trump-supporting Republican candidates on the apparent belief that they will be easier opponents to beat. Apparently, Dem campaign groups have been working behind the scenes to push candidates like Darren Bailey in Illinois, Carrie Lake in Arizona and Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania. The two things they all have in common is that they are Trump supporters and they have refused to accept the results of the 2020 presidential election. Representative Adam Kinzinger, one of the two Republican representatives on the January 6th committee, said the actions to support the candidates was disgusting. He said that the idea of, quote, Let's promote the crazy person was all well and good until you underestimate them or there's a good Republican year generally and then those people actually end up winning. You don't understand the real threat. I'm sorry, you don't understand the threat to democracy. It's worth bearing in mind that a number of Democrats originally celebrated Donald Trump winning the Republican nomination in 2016 on the grounds that, yes, he would be the easiest one to beat. Just an indicator that they don't understand how populism works and they don't learn from their mistakes. It's not only anti-Trump Republicans that are complaining, though. A number of House Democrats have been making the same point. Representative Stephanie Murphy said, no race is worth compromising your values in that way. And the point is, of course, if you spent the last two years telling America that MAGA Republicans are a danger to democracy, that if they get power again, it would be the end of the union. If you've been saying all that and then you boost them for your own election interests, doesn't suggest that you believe your own rhetoric. Representative Jason Crow said it was a terrible idea. Of course it could backfire. And that's part of the reason why I don't think it's a good idea. Not only do I think it sends the wrong message, but it's substantively risky. How risky? As risky as dropping a multi-ton piece of space junk on the Earth without knowing where it might go? Just as a random, for instance? On account of the fact that that's actually happening this weekend? It used to be that the International Space Station was a symbol that despite Cold Wars, despite antagonism on the ground, we could still collaborate in the science of space exploration. That time has now ended as we slide into the new Cold War. So China is embarked on the process of building its own orbiting space station, a second key component of which was launched a few days ago. And indeed, China is being berated by NASA and others because it's leaving a 25-ton core stage of that rocket to simply fall back to Earth. Although it will partially burn up on re-entry, a big enough chunk will survive to hit with a pretty big bang somewhere. If you're watching this video on Sunday, 31st of July, you might want to just check out the window. One astrophysicist tried to calm jitters by explaining the worst case in this event is going to be less serious than a single cruise missile strike that we've been seeing every day in the Ukraine war. So let's put it into some perspective here. Obviously, such a relief because there's no reason you'd worry about, you know, your house being hit by a cruise missile or something like that. Now, obviously, you would have to be the unluckiest person on the entire planet for that to happen to you. 
By far the most likely outcome is that it misses everybody, but that's not really the point. Anyway, space junk notwithstanding, the exercise is the building of the Tiangong Space Station, which is intended to be completed by the end of this year. China hopes to keep the station inhabited at all times by three astronauts carrying out experiments. And this week, Russia announced that it will be leaving the International Space Station after 2024, since it too will be focusing on putting up its own orbital outpost. Russia and China have also unveiled initial plans to establish a moon base, and have both been seen to be developing the capacity to blow Western satellites out of the skies. So, you know, the next Cold War is not entirely going to be like the first Cold War, that's for sure. The question is, how warm might that Cold War get? The proposal that US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi would visit Taiwan has sparked an entirely expected furious reaction from China and was one of the topics of a two-hour phone call between President Biden and Premier Xi Jinping this week. The fact that Taiwan was carrying out large-scale military drills won't have lowered the temperature any at all. Speaking in advance of Biden and Xi's call, China's Ministry of Defence spokesman Tan Kefi said China demands the US take concrete actions to fulfil its commitment not to support Taiwan independence and not to arrange for Pelosi to visit Taiwan. According to the Chinese readout from the Biden-Xi phone call, Xi was more colourful on the subject. If you play with fire, you get burned. I hope the US side can see this clearly. On the rather hotter war in Ukraine, uncertainty still persists whether the apparent agreement between the two sides to allow grain to be shipped from Ukraine will actually be honoured in practice. There were discouraging signs last week when, within days of signing the agreement, Russia hit Odessa with missiles. But reportedly, details for the safe passage of vessels are still being worked out. It was even suggested that a first shipment could take place as early as today. No sign of that yet at the time of shooting this video. Now, President Biden may or may not get around to announcing a climate emergency but by all reports, he is due soon to declare a health emergency, one involving a word I've never before felt the slightest need to mention here so far, which is monkeypox. Possibly the most stupid name for a disease we currently have, but there it is. I've not mentioned it because in my reading it's just not that big a deal, but I read that it is now time to pull your head out of the sand and face the reality of monkeypox. That's because the World Health Organization declared monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern. This has left me somewhat puzzled. Monkeypox causes an ulcer-like rash, fever, sometimes swollen lymph nodes. Are you terrified yet? At the time of shooting this video, about 18,000 cases have been seen across more than 70 countries. The infection normally goes away after a couple of weeks, but it can be serious in some people, such as infants and pregnant women. That fortunately doesn't seem to present that big a risk, because it is almost but not entirely exclusively spread by men having sex with other men, a process which involves neither infants nor women, pregnant or otherwise. This year there have been five deaths, all in Africa where the disease is endemic. Strangely enough, it didn't count as a public health emergency when it was just in Africa, but now for some reason it does. The thing that seems to be exercising some people is the fact that it's a disease being spread almost entirely amongst the gay male community. Catherine Smallwood, the WHO's senior emergency officer, said that fear of stigmatising the community most at risk has been a catalyst for slow or non-existent responses in some countries. Well, we could try just being grown up about it. Communicate directly with the gay community, let them know that if they sleep with new partners, there's a chance they get this thing that will give them sores and swollen glands for a couple of weeks. But there is a vaccine for it, so if they're worried, they can go and get that. But no, 
Smallwood said, It's going to be very difficult to contain these monkeypox outbreaks that are happening, and yet that has to be our goal. Why does that have to be the goal? I mean, there are a number of sexually transmitted diseases out there, including AIDS, which even in this treatable era is more serious than monkeypox is reported to be. So why is this so fashionable to be worried about? I mean, I honestly don't get it. The thing is that the woke-inspired shilly-shallying around that this seems to be leading people to do some odd things. So, for instance, one GP in Portugal was quoted as saying what a great job the government there had done in educating people about monkeypox because they explained to them that anyone can get it. Both technically true and yet deeply misleading at the same time. Tom Inglesby, director of the Johns Hopkins Centre for Health Security, said why he thought Biden should designate it as an emergency. We're having a lot of challenges around the country with their rate of rise in terms of new cases. It isn't an emergency posing a high threat to the general population, but it's still moving and has the potential to spread to additional vulnerable communities. So it isn't an emergency, therefore it should be designated an emergency. Right. You can't help but feel that we're living in an age where words like emergency, as well as recession come to that, are being redefined out of existence. Now, in New York, reportedly, monkeypox ignited a debate amongst the health department as to whether they should encourage gay men to reduce the number of their sexual partners. They're worried that if they do, they'll be considered as homophobic. And indeed, this is one reason why the US is not collecting demographic data on monkeypox cases at all. Luckily, the UK isn't quite so far gone on the woke downward spiral, so it does. But look, here's the thing about New York's dilemma. We just had a pandemic where they didn't think twice about telling everyone, everyone, whether highly at risk or not, to stay at home, not to see friends and family, to let granny die in her nursing home all on her own. And now you don't want to tell people not to have multiple sex partners. Well, good. I agree. You shouldn't. None of your business. Tell them it's almost exclusively being spread amongst men having sex with other men. Tell them what it does, what the risks are for the worst consequences, and then let them make their own decisions fully aware of the risk-benefit-reward that they're taking on. And then when you've practised that for monkeypox, remember how it felt for the next time when there's a Covid-type pandemic. You know, treating people like grown-ups. In any case, if we're worrying about people's health, why are we talking about monkeypox and not the fact that Covid lockdowns are thought to be likely to lead to at least 2,000 extra deaths from alcohol abuse alone, but possibly up to 25,000 deaths? A study from the University of Sheffield found that the proportion of adults drinking at risky levels increased during lockdowns from 25.6% to nearly 33%. Among the over 65s, it went from 15.6 to 21.6%. Now, the 25,000 deaths figure, which most headlines used, comes from a worst case scenario, and we know from all those other contexts, such as climate reporting, how worst case scenarios get abused in the name of clickbait. But the best case scenario, where drinking behaviours return to pre pandemic levels this year, still sees over 40,000 extra hospital admissions and approaching 2,000 deaths. Then there are the 1,000 cases of severe hepatitis amongst children between April and July this year, for which there's currently no explainable cause. Now, the analysis of potential factors gets rather complicated, and the study that was done on it was a small sample, but it posited that a factor that might have explained the incidents were COVID-19 restrictions, with children being taken out of circulation for months, meaning that they weren't being exposed to the normal cocktail of viruses and hence building their immunity. I stress again... Not enough evidence in this one study to jump to that conclusion, but it just underlines how many different ways the consequences of lockdowns could play out, how difficult it will be to attribute some of those consequences after the event. If it does turn out to be a key causal factor, then at least the good news is that it should stop happening now over subsequent months. 
But the really big news in Children's Health this week has been that the Tavistock Clinic, the specialist gender identity facility, is being closed down. It had been increasingly criticised for its willingness to abandon standards of patient care in the name of affirming children as transgender on demand and pushing them into hormone treatment. And doing so because it had capitulated to ideological trans campaign groups such as mermaids. Very much as is becoming commonplace in the US, the difference is some adults entered the room and the result is the clinic is being closed down as representing a danger to children. This follows a scathing report by Dr Hilary Cass, which warned of the potential effects of puberty blockers and the encouragement of young people to take irreversible life decisions. Nothing that the report said was new. The same concerns have been raised by whistleblowers for over two decades, only to be ignored by the clinic and condemned as transphobic, of course, by the campaigners. Indeed, as were parents. The Bayswater Support Group, made up of 400 parents who were labelled as transphobic when they raised concerns and found that clinicians subsequently refused to talk to them. But the cash report finally cut through with the National Health Service and this week it took action to shut the whole sorry mess down down. Instead, two new clinics will be set up along with regional centres with the instruction staff should maintain a broad clinical perspective to embed the care of children and young people with gender uncertainty within a broader child and adolescent health context. Which should always have been obvious but for some reason apparently wasn't. It makes sense predominantly because the phenomenon of larger numbers of young girls presenting as gender dysphoric has strong signs of social contagion, seems particularly highly seeded amongst young people with autism. In other words, rather than simply accepting a child's own diagnosis, and the report identified that there was significant coaching going on to get young people to request gender reassignment treatments in exactly the way that clinicians would respond to, Well, they should instead spend all their time looking at all of the possible issues that could help to resolve young people's mental health crisis. The process that some campaign groups try to label as conversion therapy and try to get banned in law. Until someone in government noticed the rather big difference between conversion therapy applied to people who are gay versus people who are suffering from gender dysphoria. The fact is that this has all of the hallmarks of something that will be looked back upon as a medical scandal and we will ask ourselves how people could have been so stupid as to have been taken in by it all. That moment, still some way off yet, can't come too soon as far as I'm concerned. There was a story recently where the Coldstream guard Farron Morgan blamed the body positivity movement for creating a generation of young people unable to cope with life in the armed forces. You may say it's okay to be fat, he suggested, but it's not okay to be fat in the army. Lance Sergeant Morgan added that many new recruits join up thinking that being happy is all that matters. He said that millennials in general needed to man up and stop pretending it's okay to be fat. It hasn't yet reached the situation reported from the US where the army is facing such a recruitment crisis it has opened its doors to new recruits who exceed body fat standards. Not the hugely obese, just a bit higher than the current standard with the hope that 90 days of robust training will sort them out. But of course, as the British Army critics were saying, the problem isn't just the issue of being unfit, it's the soft attitude that accompanies it. If the habits of instant gratification have led someone to become overweight, instilling the strength of discipline in them is likely to be the bigger challenge than simply shifting some body fat. The Spanish government threw this into sharp relief this week with this poster encouraging everyone to feel like they have an equally valid beach body, regardless how blimp-like that body might be. The campaign was roundly mocked from two different sides. On the one side, there were a bunch of people saying, thanks, but I don't think I need government to give me permission to take my less-than-perfect body to the beach. Thank you very much. You're really seeking to solve a problem that doesn't exist, they said. 
While on the other side, you had people saying that this seeks to normalise unhealthy standards. That was the kind version. The unkind version was people saying, nah, that's not something you want to see on the beach. It's not something anybody wants to see. Now, the point of that is it's harsh, but entirely predictable. The government said the purpose of its campaign was to tell people they should have confidence in their own bodies being as socially acceptable as anyone's. The inevitable, and I mean inevitable, backlash to that poster just reinforced in those people's minds the exact opposite. Yes, if you waddle your way onto the sands, some people, not all, maybe not the best people, who knows, but some people will indeed be judging you. If you care about that, maybe that's not the unalloyed bad thing the government thinks, because it might put pressure on you to act to change it. Social norms have always had an unkind side, but usually they existed for a reason. You could have just mitigated the unkindness without going all the way towards actually incentivising and rewarding harmful practices. So the point is this, giving in to instant gratification makes you weak. Having the self-discipline to focus on what is needed, not just what is wanted, that makes you stronger. Keeping a fit body helps to keep a fit mind. You know all of that. And the people telling you otherwise are the seducers who are not your friends. If your society produces posters like this and is then scratching its head wondering why it can't find fit and disciplined young warriors for its army, well, that's its problem. I mean, it will eventually come round because necessity will push it that way. But in the meantime, it is down to you and only you not to fall for it. If social norms are no longer enforced by clear signals of approval and disapproval, just hold yourself to higher standards. And that's all. Don't seek to unilaterally apply those standards to others, blaming and shaming. Just be the better role model. And even if you know for a fact that you will never have any interest in, for example, joining the army, doesn't matter. There are precious few walks in life where it won't hand you an advantage to have that sort of discipline when you're in a world of people who are just living from one snack to the next. All right. My thanks, as always, goes to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. As you know, I simply could not afford the time that it takes to research and then produce the videos that I do for this channel without them. Neither would it be easy to talk about whatever topics present themselves. For instance, the transgender issue, which in the UK at least now seems to be turning around so that, yes, two years ago a discussion that would have had you labelled as transphobic is now becoming mainstreamed about a discussion about simple grown-up questions of what constitutes clinical care. This is a positive thing. But it shouldn't mean that two years ago... We were all right to be living in fear of the shadow of being called a phobic something. The ability to call out the truth as it seems to be is the process whereby you get from where we were two years ago to where we happily seem to be arriving now. The process is so important. And yes, this channel makes only a small contribution to it, but surely every contribution matters and that's why it will continue. And that's why every week I will take some time to thank the Patreon supporters for making it happen. If you would like to join that exclusive and elite group by giving your support for the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please head along over to patreon.com forward slash Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.